Uh, okay, so there we are recording. And welcome, everyone. I'm just going to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Mr. Elise Boots is a seasoned manager of several diagnostic and research laboratories within the Center for Human Metabolomics here at Northwest University at Potterstrom campus. She also has been involved in the development of multiple untargeted metabolomics methodologies across various sample matrices and has published numerous papers and two book chapters on the topic. She completed her MSc in, bi in biochemistry, specializing in untargeted GCGC TOF MS sputum metabolomics, so that's in the field of TB. And she is currently focusing on monitoring quality laboratory procedures by managing routine diagnostic processes and the overall staff training in line with ISO 15189 standards for SANUS accreditation purposes. And her topic that she's going to talk about today is specifically on LC columns, liquid, chromatom liquid chromatography columns, so intelligent selection based on target analyte chemistry. So I'm going to hand it over to Dara Lee. She has a presentation for us that she's going to play. All over to you, Darylise. Uh, just unmute yourself, Darylise. Oh, sorry. Let me just start that again. Thank you, Shane. just there we go good day and thank you for joining in for this journal club presentation on lc columns and intelligent selection based on target analyte chemistry for this presentation we'll first have a look at some background and fundamental concepts um, and we'll then have a look at the different column types that are available as well as the column chemistry of each um, and then ultimately, how would we go about selecting a specific column for a specific application? Uh, also considering the inner life chemistry involved. Um, and then we we'll have some concluding remarks. Starting off, one has to look at the different types of quantum chromatography that are actually available, but the most primitive one being gravity chromatography. And this one relies primarily on use of hand crack columns, um, and it's mainly used for single step verifications like resorting and affinity applications. So um, as you can see on the right, a simple DIY water filtration system would actually work on the basis of gravity, gravity chromatography. Um, and this differs uh, to low pressure, medium and high pressure chromatography in that pressure is not applied to force the, in this case, the water would be an example of the mobile phase through the pebble, sand, and the charcoal would be a representation of the stationary phase um, to get an end product that is then a lot purer. So um, it relies completely on gravity um, for movement of the liquid phase through the stationary phase. Um, looking at low pressure chromatography, is where a little bit of pressure um, is applied to force the mobile phase through the column. Um, and it's mostly used for separating proteins um, because it is very cost effective. Um, medium pressure chromatography is then where a little bit more pressure is applied. And this is typically used to separate complex uh, mixtures to collect a specific fraction of interest. Also, uh, just some basic concepts on how LC column chromatography works, since uh, we'll need the terminology for later in the presentation. And just to emphasize, this is uh, with the focus on LC and in essence, high pressure liquid chromatography. So in a nutshell, a mixture of solvent is loaded um, onto a column with, uh, that's packed with the porous matrix, which is then also uh, referred to as the stationary phase. And in the process, these molecules migrate at different rates, uh, some emitting faster, some emitting slower. Uh, slower. 
um, carried by the mobile phase being um, through the pollen. And this is then either promoted or inhibited by the specific nature of the stationary phase or the um, mobile phase as well. And also the target analyte step on top. Looking at the different types of LC columns available, um, firstly, then we have liquid liquid, which is not as popular, um, probably because the stationary phase itself is also a liquid, and this results then in limited stability and also very inconvenient to use. Uh, the second one being liquid solid, which is the most commonly used, and also the one that we'll discuss at length during this presentation. So yeah, your stationary phase is actually a solid. Uh, the last one is then ion exchange, and yeah, the stationary phase is an ion exchange resin, and partitioning then occurs with ion exchanges happening between the analyte and the stationary phase. And then these uh, different type of columns is then either used um, in one or two different chromatography modes. So the first one being reverse phase, where uh, you have a non-polar stationary phase and a polar mobile phase uh, versus your normal phase chromatography where you have a very polar stationary phase and a non-polar mobile phase. So the two then just being distinguished based on the uh, polarity application. Um, and with reverse phase, you then um, have solvents that are more mobile phases that are more aqueous, such as acetonite or methanol, uh, combined with water in whichever ratio. And the most polar compounds then will be first, where with normal phase, your mobile phase is mostly um, organic type of uh, solvents, such as methane, chloroform, hexane, and your most non-polar compounds um, even be first for this mode. Apart from polarity, there are also um, various other column chromatographic methods that can be used to also aid in its separation of either a specific compound class or a target analyte with a distinct uh, characteristic. For example, uh, if you look at size exclusion chromatography, this is then when molecules are um, separated based on their size and not necessarily their molecular weight. So as you see here, uh, the larger um, molecules would then move faster because they move very fast through the pores, as in there's no resistance for them to move through, where the smaller molecules would actually remain in the pollen and move a lot later. Um, the second one is then affinity chromatography. And uh, this is then where you would have a, a molecule binding specifically to a protein or a ligand, and the ligand is then cross-linked directly to a matrix. And then after your protein of interest binds to the ligand, this uh, complex then stays immobilized inside the pollen, and the unbound protein then moves freely through the pollen. And once all of the unbound proteins have left the pollen, you then can apply an emission buffer uh, to reduce your target protein um, that you have now um, that is retained in your pollen and then uh, collect that specific fraction. A third one is the ion exchange chromatography, and uh, uh, this one is used to separate ions and molecules that can be easily ionized. So the separation of the ions depends on the ion's affinity for the stationary phase, which then in essence creates an ion, uh, an ion exchange system. Um, the fourth one is then chiral, chromatography, and these are usually used for um, separation of enantiomers um, or for uh, separating of racemic mixtures. The last two, then uh, starting off with Helix, uh, which is hydrophilic interaction with the chromatography, and this is where a highly polar stationary phase is then combined with a non-polar mobile phase system. And this is typically used for compounds which are very difficult to obtain with a uh, reverse phase. And the last one, namely HIC, or hydrophobic interaction chromatography, 
Uh, so this one is usually used to separate and purify protein molecules um, on the basis of the hydrophobicity. Uh, they can also it can also be used for samples with high ionic strengths. So um, overall separations of substances uh, based on their very strength of interaction with hydrophobic groups um, attached to an uncharged gel matrix. Then. In this slide, then just a summary of um, the LC modes and chromatographic methods we just discussed, uh, along with the a summary of the mechanism involved. So we're now going to have a look at the type of column stationary phases available for some of the um, modes of separation that we actually just discussed. So LC columns are usually packed with porous particles made from either polymer or glass beads, of which silica is the most common. So the packing material is then usually hydrolyzed silica, which reacts with the bond phase coating. And uh, some of the most popular well-known bond phase coatings are the solar stains, and that is also then the structure um, that is displayed on the slide um, currently. So as you can see, the, the functional groups um, marked with the Rs on the siloxane chain. Uh, so there can be different um, R groups attached to the siloxane, and this can then be varied depending on the type of column and the analyte being um, analyzed. So for example, uh, the R group could be a new group um, that's attached, uh, which then results in a new column that is utilized in reverse phase chromatography, for example. So in normal phase, the most common R groups attached to siloxane are the diol amino, cyano, and dimethyl amino. And um, for reverse phase, commonly, it would be C8 or C18 or any hydrocarbon. And um, this thing is how we get to be using a C8 column or C18 column. So um, this refers to the R groups that are actually attached to the siloxane. So looking at the R groups, as um, shown on the previous slides, each of them have functional group interactions and unique properties based on their respective group chemistries. So for example, aromatic compounds have distinctive steric interaction, um, or otherwise known as pi pi interactions, where alkyl phases, for example, have a high affinity group that with carbon groups. And each of these then contribute to either better or poorer retention of target analytes. So this slide actually summarizes the most significant interactions between solid and stationary phases that contribute to column selectivity. I'm using hydrophobicity as an example. So um, the more, um, the higher the column high hydrophobicity, the higher the ability of a phase to hydrophobically interact with carbon groups. So for our fuel phase, phases or C18 type of products, this is then a very important um, bonding uh, requirement interaction. Uh, if you look at for the new phases or the new type columns, the ability of that specific phase to separate compound based on structural differences um, would then be one of the most important parameters to consider for selectivity of that specific one. So I think it's very clear that different column bonded phases exhibit different combinations of possible solid stationary phase interactions. So considering the, the mentioned uh, selectivity parameters in the previous slide, this is then a summary of which molecular interactions are associated with the functional groups, which makes it easier to distinguish probable interaction strengths uh, for um, column types. So in essence, column classification is actually done based on um, interaction strengths for specific functional groups that would promote um, binding of that um, specific analyte uh, and its compatibility with the interaction strength of a specific column's bonded phase. Ultimately then across all brands, um, the same type of column classification is then used. 
um, mainly categorizing um, all of the columns based on their um, molecular interactions and uh, the strength of those interactions. So as you can see here, as an example from um, Cephal you will see it is also used according to um, C18, which is your alkyl phase type columns, aromatic compounds where um, you have five by interactions as well as your unique columns where you have bonded cyano and uh, amino groups. Um, so ultimately, um, whether you look at all the different supplies and in the next couple of slides, um, I'll have a summary just um, reflecting this. So it really doesn't matter then um, which guide we look at or which supply you make use of. Um, the column selection and the column classification is then based on the same principle throughout. This then uh, another example of the Cephalpho range, and as you can see, all columns are grouped according to other hydrophobic, polar, non polar. Um, does it have strong dipole interactions? Um, is it hydrogen bond beam? So, um, as you can see, the classification and um, of all the columns has been done according to that specific um, interaction with the, the intended target um, analyte. So, looking at the adjuvant. Um, brochure as well or their range. If you can see that it also goes according to um, those uh, selectivity parameters um, that we showed earlier. So hydrophilic, hydrophobic, um, also when they actually bring in the modes as well, um, size exclusion, affinity of the ion exchange and um, their columns is then grouped according to the um, the interactions. Then for microscope water as well, uh, so as you can see, we on to selectivity, um, indicating the reverse phase or um, normal phase with the type of products available. There are numerous color guides available, and I really do think that suppliers do make an effort to try and make it as elaborate as possible uh, so that it's fairly easy to make find the specific column that you need your intended application. Lastly, then, an example from the thermometer range, and as you can see, um, the grouping stays more or less the same. Um, they just have a, a specific a column class for peptides, for example, and chiral compounds, uh, which yeah, differs from company to company depending on the who their biggest clients are. Yes. So now that we have the column classifications and applications done for the team, um, so there there are also a couple of additional factors that you need to consider before making your final decision. So um, as you know, a mass spectrometry or MS is one of the most popular detection, detection techniques for um, LC. And, but it's also a technique that's not compatible with many mobile face buffers and solvents um, that are used, for example, in UV detection. So in addition to this, uh, the column dimension must also be taken in, into consideration as well as um, the compatibility of your mobile phase with uh, your specific phase and also um, the uh, analytical platform that you would like to use. So um, the correct mode of separation, the specific compound structure, the solubility, like looking at the log key values for that specific analyte, all of these need to be taken into consideration as well. So for reverse phase, um, you usually want to perform high resolution separations um, on a wide range of compounds. So um, the selection of your mobile phase uh, needs to be, is one of the very important things to ensure selectivity and um, detection of your specific target or uh, analog of interest. Um, with ion exchange, uh, it requires in a, inorganic buffer solutions. That's also mostly not compatible with MS, so it's also one thing to 
um, consider we touched on some of the analyte properties and how it relates to the ultimate separation that we'd like to achieve. Uh, so this uh, slide then just a summary of um, some of the critical factors that we actually have to do that before you make the final decision. So, um, for example, is it an acid or a base? Uh, so yeah, the chemical composition and structure of the animal is really the, the important thing that we determine um, which decisions we make further down. So what is uh, the hydrogen bond capability? Uh, what's the log P value? How soluble is the the analyte action? And then um, also one of the very important additional things to consider is the behavior and detectability of that specific analyte when it's subjected to either UV or MS modes of detection. So for example, is it only visible under fluorescence binded to a specific marker? So uh, this is really where uh, you start looking at the properties um, of the analyte in vivo in order to make the best decision going forward. An introduction uh, just briefly on what a long-term value action is. So it is by definition um, our readily an analytical partition between an aqueous and organic phase. So um, its official name is actually the water optimal logarithmic partition partition. So if a compound is predominantly hydrophobic with a positive log-in value, then the use of a reverse phase following is then recommended. So for low to medium polarity analytes, uh, normal phase um, HPLC or unique um, techniques are being employed. So the lower your locking value, the more po polar um, or hydrophilic the compound. And the higher your locking value, the more hydrophobic the compound. And um, as indicated here, you would rather use reverse phase as opposed to normal phase. So selecting the most suitable column is really highly dependent on the sample undergoing the analysis as well. So while compounds can often be separated using various column chemistries, some column selectivities are better suited than others for certain compound classes. Um, so the table here in the um, many of these available in literature um, this particular one shows a selection of classes of compounds um, that's typically analyzed by LC columns available and indicated with a one or two, meaning um, the one would signify that it's actually a very good fit for that specific application and that uh, compound class, um, the use of that column. For, so for example, alcohols, as we saw in the previous slide, had a log P value of minus 0 0.1. And here you can see that it's indicated um, using uh, a unique column uh, and using normal phase, um, the normal phase mode uh, chromatography for analysis. So um, the type of column and the um, mode, uh, LC mode used. Uh, relates then directly to the solubility of the analyte and the indirect production value as well. So then assuming that you finally have your answer on whether to use reverse phase or normal phase mode, and you are relatively sure that you can at least detect your compound, you have to now still decide what type of separation it is to require. So is there retention preference or you? Uh, you want to separate isomeric compounds of specific target function groups, or um, so sometimes you've already started with a specific column and you would like to optimize the peak shape or to obtain the retention of a charge base, for example. So this is then where you start narrowing the type of column that you use or the column class, um, narrowing it down to something more specific for your um, intended application. So if you look at simply, yes, you decided I have to reverse phase, but now you have an option of using either the C18 or C18 or C4 column, and these differ um, based on the percentage of the carbon content. 
um, for that specific column. So you typically see that with a C18 column, uh, compounds tend to be retained a little bit longer in addition moving to a column with a lesser carbon load. Um, your retention time then also decreases. So just to get some additional uh, terminology out of the way, um, we just made mention of culminate particle five and four size um, on the previous slide, but I don't think we're always that sure or know what it really means when we look at the common specifications. Uh, so particle size, the definition refers to the mean diameter of the spherical supports used to affect the volume, while the pore size is the average size of a pore. Um, in a porous backing. So smaller particle sizes have been shown to offer um, higher peak efficiencies. And so over the years, porous uh, spherical microparticles continue to decrease in size, resulting in more efficient columns. So larger pores um, reduce the obstruction of the analyte's movement uh, and thereby maintaining the analyte's ability to diffuse efficiently. But um, if these pores are too small, they can obstruct movement and cause lower chromatographic efficiency due to the high resistance to mass transfer. So the smaller pore size backings, um, ranging from about 80 to 120 angstroms, are best for small molecules um, with molecular weights up to uh, 2,000. And so typically pore sizes uh, range from 60 to 1,000 um, angstroms or 6 to 100 nanometers, while particle sizes um, mostly range uh, from 10 to 100 microns. So smaller particle size does improve efficiency of uh, separation without increasing the runtime, the content, or the flow rate. And in the center here, you know, just an example of the conventional naming of um, columns uh, commercially. So um, it could be initially the name, and this is usually a supply of the domain, followed by the stationary phase, the APMC8, um, the column length, um, and then the internal diameter, the particle size, and then sometimes they also include the pore size as well. And in the same thing, we have just an example of the... So just again, there are two popular particle size types of note, namely um, the total porous particle type, or PPP, also termed um, queen porous particles, FPPs by some. And then the latest SPPs, um, which are superficially porous silica particles, with sizes under three micron, and this has, has actually generated quite a significant interest in the chromatographic community. So this being because the solid core material is um, more than an order of magnitude smaller than the older packing of the past, and suppliers have now produced many variations, um, such as the fused core, core shell, and porous shell, just to name a few. So um, all of these utilizing the SPP uh, technology with the thinner shell, where um, molecules can then be fused into and out of this thin layer very quickly, even at high flow rates, um, and thereby improving mass transfer kinetics. And now we get to the typing part, the equation that everybody loves. <laughs> so I think this is probably the reason why many seem to be afraid of molecular chemistry. So when you do open up a guide, there's sometimes a vast number of equations that, sort of that um, does cause some confusion because which parameter do you now rate the guy is sort of most important. So today I'm just going to go through two of the utmost important parameters. So this, they are the highest contributors to your ultimate um, separation. So the first one being resolution and um, the other one being efficiency. So resolution is impacted then by K alpha and N, um, K being the average retention factor, alpha your separation factor, and N the number of theoretical plates for your problem. So uh, K and alpha is then determined by the resolution of your mobile phase, your stationary phase temperature, uh, chemistry, and the temperature. Uh, N is then affected by your column length, 
your particle size and your um, pore size. So chromatographic resolution is then most influenced by selectivity, so as you can see on the graph, um, selectivity, selectivity is the one you can see uh, that is highest proportional to the other two, and um, this one then also if change does have the uh, most effect on your ultimate resolution. So, for example, if you do struggle with um, trying to get compounds separated, it is recommended to first look at your composition of your mobile phase, the stationary phase chem uh, chemistry, and the temperature, since those contribute the most to your um, ultimate resolution achieved. So, it would be better to um, change those parameters instead of um, changing the column name or particle size or pore size, for example. The second most important one then in efficiency, which is evaluated by the Trump equation. Uh, so it evaluates efficiency as a function of linear velocity or flow rate, where H is then the plate height, and this is determined by dividing the column length by the calculated number of theoretical plates. So the ultimate goal is to get a um, small plate height in the end. So the smaller the plate height, the higher the plate number, and the greater the chromatographic resolution. So if you look at the um, image on the bottom right, you can see a representation of analysis done ranging from um, starting off with 5,000 theoretical plates up to 20,000. And as you can see, peak work then decreases with increasing um, in for the number of theoretical plates. So also to note, um, so as your particle size decreases, um, the op optimum linear velocity also increases. So on the um, curve, you can see the uh, indicator D to 10 micrometer, to 5 micrometer. So um, as particle size increases, um, it it does yield flatter curves um, with a minimal shift to higher flow rates. Depending on the scale and or efficiency of the separation you require, and this table shown here, and once again there are many available from suppliers, can help you to choose a column um, by the most appropriate inner diameter and column length uh, for your needs. Depending on the scale and or efficiency of the separation you require, and this table shown here, and once again, there are many available from suppliers, can help you to choose a column um, by the most appropriate inner diameter and column length uh, for your needs. So it really depends on what you want to do. So if you want to maximize the speed of your application, 20 to um, 75 millimeter length would probably be okay. Um, if you want to balance resolution and speed, um, about 100 millimeter length would uh, work. And if you want the best resolution possible, um, 150 millimeter length would be used. So nowadays, the 300 is um, not as popular anymore. So um, we mostly make use of between 100 and 150 millimeter length. Um, there are also numerous specs and information available for predicted flow rates with increasing volume length and inner dimension that can give one some indication of the respective loading capacities of the columns as well. So the inner dimension also plays a big role in the observed flow rates, um, which obviously decrease or decrease in internal diameter, but there's also then result in limitations for sample volumes um, that you can. Looking at inner diameter and particle size, uh, the use of smaller inner diameter columns do result in decreased solvent usage. Uh, since it uses less mobile phase, you'll see the same linear velocity and thus analysis time can then be reduced by increasing the flow rate. So in addition to this, the peak response is increased with small um, internal diameter columns. The peak height increases then as the column diameter decreases, which is beneficial when analyzing mass limited samples like 
we typically do um, and use in the township in these applications. Uh, particle size then also affects uh, the separation efficiency and resolution due to the surface area available within a, a given column. But the higher efficiencies that you obtain, it can also at the expense of higher bad pressures. So as illustrated here um, in the chromatogram in the middle, um, we have we see an increase in back pressure from 48 bar for a five micron particle size um, column to as much as 337 bar with a 1.9 micron one. Uh, so typically five micron mark uh, particles are suitable for routine analysis where samples are not particularly complex. So they provide lower resolution than three micron columns, five micron um, one also require much lower pressures and can require less maintenance than smaller particle size columns. So which makes them a good choice when superior resolution is not necessary. A smaller particle size column can then be chosen either to increase the overall resolution for more complex samples or to increase analysis speed by shortening the column length while maintaining the same resolution. Prioritizing specific needs helps to select um, the best suitable column material for different chromatographic demands. And then depending on the sample, the analytes or matrix, also the lab environment, for example, the instrumentation and the separation goal, the best column choice can, can look very different from task to task, given the many different selectivities that are available for different column materials. So this is then the point where additional factors such as pH preference um, and temperature um, sample throughput uh, that you require, the column lifetime, et cetera, uh, should then be considered before you know, uh, the final column selection. So this table here is adapted from the Sukalto column guide documentation, and it just shows an example of how recommended use of a specific column is ranked from one to five based on your particular need. So the success of a HPLC method depends strongly and on uh, the consistent quality of the stationary phase, and then also long-term reproducibility is obviously impacted in achieving um, reliable results with your method. And if all else fails, and even after this presentation, you really don't know where to start with which type of column to use, which is hard to do. Um, there are some online platforms available. Um, this online column coach um, from Waters is actually very helpful uh, to check for alternative columns that you can use, perhaps to enter a compound class and search the database for columns that was freely used for um, that specific application, and then you can just go your selection um, from there. In my experience, uh, many are afraid of the column selection process um, since they find it difficult to rank characteristics according to higher or lower importance. So I think what ultimately works best is just to narrow down each category and each requirement and really review the properties of your target analyte group and then make tiered tier decision um, in each phase of the selection process. So I think the flow of this presentation does represent a feasible plan or workflow for the column selection process, starting off firstly then considering your analyte's chemical structure and composition and this will then provide an answer as to follow the polar, reverse phase, or non polar normal phase from a probably just to start off with. So, thirdly, you obviously have to identify that there's a very special need for a specific targeted separation. Um, you need to use size exclusion, for example, or thyroid um, from the property methods. Um, hopefully, we should look at the functional group chemistry of the interactions for selectivity. And this is the um, selectivity parameters we looked at we uh, you kind of determine whether your analyte has more um, aromatic properties where it plays mostly or interacts mostly using five by interactions, or is it hydrophobic, um, et cetera. And then uh, Number five, um, 
obviously you have to look at the analytes solubility and also the mobile phases compatibility. So this is where we had a look at the log key values, uh, the detectability of the analyte. Um, is it detectable only with UV or with fluorescence, for example? Um, then rated here number six is then focusing on the grade of separation and the, um, the retention that we require. So this is where you look at, yes, I have decided that we reverse phase, but there are different um, lengths and different carbon content um, volumes available. And um, so what type of retention is really important for your application? Is it I think the method, for example, um, and things like that to consider. So seven um, is where you actually consider the problem's characteristics, um, the type of particles that you would like to use, and this is mainly the pore size. Um, are you going to use some of the older, older generation pore size um, particles available, or the more recent SDP type of um, particle size? Uh, and at number eight, I have the, which is probably the one that carries the most weight, um, the chromatographic, um, chromatographic resolution and efficiency. So this is where you look at the resolution, the speed, and the flow rate, for example, um, how you optimize this to get the um, best color efficiency and the best um, analyte resolution, for example. Then at number nine, um, the required column dimension. So this is where you decide this is the length that would be appropriate. Um, the internal diameter, the particle size, um, which also the uh, slots in with number eight, where you actually get to consider the um, speed of the um, separation and whether the resolution and uh, so forth is adequate. Then lastly, um, you have all the additional or specific needs, and this is like column life, um, how often are you going to be using uh, the following quality once a month in just the formal analysis. Um, the pH, how stable is the pH um, depending on the column life for that specific um, stationary phase. And then also the environment, um, the um, instrument that you would like to use it on and also the temperature. And so in conclusion, finally, um, I think it's it's fair to say that understanding problems attributes, um, the particle technology involved, as well as the bonding technology does guide one to and make a better conversation in the end. And so in conclusion, in my experience, um, thank you. I would just then like to take a moment to thank Phenomenix um, Separations, uh, Microsoft Waters and um, Matrix Agilent for um, some of the material that they uh, supplied that we could incorporate into the presentations. And I would just like to mention that even though um, most of the, the information shown here is from the three different companies, these are the three that we use mostly for our application. And um, there are definitely other companies uh, that provide similar products out there as well. These three were just um, referenced by the fact because we are most familiar with their um, products and make use of it for our routine analysis. Thank you very much for um, joining in. And I really hope that you learned something that you can use and apply in your uh, specific work environment as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derelise. So who, who are you in that picture? Oh, yeah, at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Derelise at the end there. Right, yeah. So are there any questions or feedback comments for the presenter today? Yeah, um, can you please hear me? Yes. Yes.
Yeah, please. This is Adeo. I'm speaking to you from uh, South Africa here. Uh, may I please ask um, if uh, we will get uh, copies of the presentation uh, for the participants? Yes, everything is uploaded onto the YouTube channel, um, the recording of this session. Um, there it is. Would you be opposed to us sending the presentation? Not at all. It's it's okay. So if you like, you can email me and I can send you the actual presentation that um, has been pre-recorded by Derelise. If you want to stop at a certain slide and find more information there. Okay. Which email is that, sir, if you don't mind? Uh, I'll put it in the chat now. Okay. Thanks, sir. So this is also a good time to advertise everyone who, who wants to present in the future journal clubs. You can email me at nmr.nw at gmail.com if you want to present in future journal clubs. So yeah, there's a lot of information there that I think it might be a good idea if you want to digest yeah. it a bit slower. Um, you can email me and I'll send it to you. Alternatively, it'll be uploaded onto YouTube and you can play it again um, to get to the points where interest you the most yeah, yes uh, if i can just comment as well um as i said these uh the details of this is it's, it's sometimes it's very overwhelming um because it it differs from supplier to supplier but luckily they do provide um a lot of information on this and um i think that um the one that we just say yeah, the online one that you can make use of is also very helpful. I've tried this before and it really, um, it does help to point you in the right direction when you're just make, starting to make your selection and so on. Yeah, and each company has its own sales representative or specialist, mm -hmm. which you, you, their job is there to help you make the right selection. So just contact your supplier, um, Waters, Thermo, Agilent, whoever you deal with mostly with, then find out who the specialist is and talk with them. Don't be scared to reach out to them. But it's also good for you to learn, to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the, the, the purpose of this talk is to put some context and understanding into selection of the LC column. Anyone else have any questions or feedback? There is, I don't know, would you like to put your email into the chat as well? In case anyone wants to contact you with a question. I can do that. There you go, it's in the chat. Let me just add my name as well. <laughs> so you can see in the chat box there, there is Derelisa's email address. Uh, we always motivate people to contact the speaker um, with any, with any follow-up questions or comments, um, collaboration, or just, you know, out of interest. We like to promote communication between people. That's why we do these journal clubs. Okay, so if there are no comments or questions, I just want to thank the speaker again. Thank you, Derelise. It was a very nice presentation. It's a pleasure. Thanks, guys, for the opportunity. I hope really hope you learned something. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll see thank you next you. time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks.